Okay, just a little quick review. And uh, uh, we have four rooms. We have four areas in our right brain. And we'll review what they're called and what they do. So we have the thalamus. And remember that the thalamus is at the base of the brain. And what it's for is attachment. And what do we mean when we say attachment? We mean the way in which we, as human beings, connect to one another. Parent, child, sibling, and spouse. And then just above that thalamus is this little thing about the size of a pea, and it's called the amygdala. And that is what we call our joy center. Uh, it is a little doorway, if you will. That's one way of thinking about it, that everything that passes through that door gets stamped either joy or bad and scary. So the earlier in life that we have to experience bad and scary, the more set that part of our brain is. And pretty soon, it rules our life. And of course, if our experiences are joy-based, that also rules our life. <laughs> so sometimes we might wonder why it is that, how is it that a person can get married to somebody bad and scary, and it doesn't work out too well, the next thing you know, they're back with another person that's bad and scary. <laughs> and that's because that part of that little part of the brain is running the life, that normal, had become bad and scary. So God is giving us an amygdala so that normal is joy-based. Joy, joy, normal is being glad to be together in a healthy way. So that's number two. Room number two. Number three is this thing called the cingulate cortex. I don't have a, a picture of it uh, today, but just you know, it just runs along the side here, and it has a little bit of a curve, and it looks pretty much like a banana. And that's the largest part of our right brain function. And, of course, it synchronizes everything in life. Everything. So, <clears throat> it synchronizes. You know, <laughs> it's a sim it's a, some of these things are so simple. I don't know if we're aware of this, and, and sometimes I'll become aware of it if I'm sitting next to somebody, and there's <laughs> Scott here, and he's got his leg crossed like this. I won't even be thinking about it, and I'll do the same thing. You know, we, we, uh, and <clears throat> you know, or someone sitting like this, and I'm not even aware of it, but then I do the same thing. And so we're just we subconsciously synchronize with other people, and our bodies. Sometimes will indicate that, um, and the synchronization that really matters is when I'm synchronizing with another person's emotions, because emotions are where we connect. Now, this is an experiment. I'll just share this with you, and this is amazing. It really works. Uh, and we did this many, many times <clears throat> when I was trained. So imagine behind me, right, we've got a screen, and we're watch you're watching a movie. So, so Jerry, right? Yes. Jerry. So Jerry, let's say you're watching a movie, and I'll be sitting here in a chair facing you, and we're going to show things on that movie that are very emotionally moving. And we're going to hook you up to a temperature sensor and a pulse indicator, and, and then hook me up to a temperature and pulse indicator. And I now you have maybe earbuds in, so I have no idea what you're looking at. I can't even hear it. But your face is going to indicate the emotions that you're experiencing. And all I have is your face to look at. So by looking into your face, what happens is, is that my pulse and my blood blood pressure 
and uh, body temperatures, three things. Uh, yours and mine are going to be uh, coming into a synchronization together. Your pressure goes up, your body temperature, your pulse, and mine will go up with you and down with you. And I have no idea what you're looking at, but I know, but emotionally it's on your face. If, especially, I mean, if you're fully engaged. And this, um, we've, we've, uh, what we've done is something like this, but not quite. We have a little church, sometimes it meets in our home, uh, and we will, uh, uh, sometimes in the evening, we'll watch something that is a, a training in which we're trying to teach lessons like faithfulness, in integrity, uh, honesty. And we're all watching this film, <clears throat> and it's a totally different experience, if you think you're aware of this, than if I'm watching it all by myself in a room. Because what's happening is we're all sharing an emotion together. And if, as we share that emotion, we're remembering stories. So this is back, this is exactly what the scriptures is doing. The scriptures give us a story that we're all familiar with. We're all sharing that story. We're actually stepping into the emotions of the character who lived 4,000 years ago. So this part of our brain has nothing to do with time. It's always in the present. So it doesn't matter <clears throat> if the experience that it taps into is one when I was 12 years old. It all of a sudden is now in the present. So our stories bring all of us into the present. And that's synchronization. Uh, a shared mind state crosses time barriers. And it crosses all, pretty much, I can't think of anything that it doesn't cross. Uh, it brings us all together until we feel like we're part of one family. And number four, the right prefrontal cortex. Individual and group identity. So, what does that mean? It's the, last, it's the last of the four. Being accepted for who I really am. And as a result of that, here comes, here comes two more. As a result of that, being benefited by others through my God-given abilities. So how do I benefit other people? By being alive. <laughs> Uh, now, let's, let's talk just a little bit, <laughs> welcome, <laughs> let's talk just a little bit about what that four level does. Uh, this is the miracle of creation, and this is a description of freedom like no other. How is it that I can be myself and be part of a group at the same time, and both are preserved. You know, you could have a group swallowing up a ind person's individual identity, or you could have a very powerful person that is dictating to a group their identity. So how is it that God can take group identity and individual identity, merge them so that neither controls the other? And this is, <clears throat> this only happens if we're able to receive, I, I shouldn't say only happens, I should say it's designed to happen. When we're younger, <clears throat> growing up, if we have a face that is glad to be with us, in, all, in the trials that we go through, especially as little children, that will, that is that room number two that we just talked about, that's glad, that's glad to be with you. That takes care of our fears. And if we're not afraid, then we're able to synchronize. That was what we just talked about. And if we're able to synchronize, then that will build our individual identity within our little family circle in which we can act like who God made us to be. And at first, <clears throat> it's, it's not complicated. 
but as we grow older, it becomes more complex. And our brain just says, okay, the bigger world is like my little family. I'm still me. And I still, uh, I, ha I, haven't, I haven't been traumatized. And remember the difference between trauma and suffering. So trauma means that whatever experience has happened to me is greater than my ability to get back to joy. Okay? Whereas suffering means I remain the same person, my identity remains intact, and I'm able to continue functioning. So we look at the life of Christ, right? Jesus suffered terribly, but he was not traumatized. He remained the same loving, life-giving person under pressure. Whereas when we are, if we suffer that, you know, we would be in danger of trauma. Um, <clears throat> and uh, 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 I was going to say something else about trauma. <clears throat> Remaining the same person that we are in all circumstances. Um, it wasn't that, but I. I well, there's there's post traumatic, but I'm going to. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm thinking of an example in the life of Christ. I'll, maybe I'll just put it this way. That is that <clears throat> when Jesus was under pressure, he continued to give life to the situation because that's who he was. When we're put under pressure, we're tempted to bring death to the situation. Okay, <laughs> all right. Exactly. Yes. We are, we can't hardly turn the other cheek. We can't do that. Uh, and so what's even if we watch a film and it has a hero in it, what are we what, we can't wait for the hero to take revenge yeah. on what was done to him, that's right? Yeah. yeah. And and that's actually training our brains mm -hmm. okay to be traumatized. Okay. So the scriptures, the story scriptures, the, the scriptures in the, you know, the story in the scriptures, we have many stories that end where the person who is punished cries out to God, you know, get, take vengeance. You know, we have Samson. Okay? But then we have the stories like Joseph, we talked about today. We have Daniel. These are the exceptions where the top part of the brain, what we call room number four, which is our identity, remained intact. You know, thrown into the lion's den. Remained the same person in the midst of what would normally be trauma. Uh, so this is, the, this is the journey that God is taking us on, that we can be that same person. Uh, Herbert. Yes, that would be a good definition for maturity. Okay. And remain the, remain the same person no matter what the circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, another definition for maturity, which, which fits this one, mm -hmm. and I, I'm gently just opening this up as Q&R, so this is not a lecture. <laughs> so would be that we become more complex. Mm -hmm. We remain the same person, but our complexity increases in terms of our ability to, to synchronize, our ability to to think, our ability to, to process the situation, et cetera. And that's, that's, that's what, there's no question, right, as adults that we're more complex than we were when we were infants, right? Yeah. But we are the same person, right. Right. Uh, which is an amazing thing to observe. <laughs> right. And I remember when, when Enoch was first born, and we, I think, understand this when we, when we have children, the things that I see in Enoch now, they were there when he was a child. But I didn't know what it was. <laughs> but you look back and you say, oh, that's what it was. <laughs> so, all right, so the last point for, for this, for this uh, uh, interchange here. And there are many, many things we can get into. And so we'll, the, the, the Q&R, we'll take all the rabbit trails we need to take, okay? But this, is, this point is important, and that is 80% of the Bible, you remember, is nonverbal. Nonverbal in the sense that it's stories. Nonverbal, it's, it's non calculations and 
non uh, formula. Non didactic. That's, that's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. It's stories. And the stories invoke emotions, and that's what's nonverbal. And 80% of our brain processing <clears throat> is nonverbal. But the important thing is that our brain processes four questions, and, our, and the Bible processes the same four questions. Uh, and so this is one of the ways that we know, and I'm going to read you a text, and I, I like this text, and see if I can just, I had it here. It's in Psalms, and it is, I should know it by heart, it is Psalms, um, Okay, I will quote it to you from memory. Um, but I'm going to do one last search here. Psalms. There it is. That's it, Enoch. Psalms 27, verse 8. Okay, when you said, Seek my face, my heart said unto thee. So when you said, Seek my face, my heart said. Thy face will I seek. Now, there's an alternate interpretation or, or alternate way of translating that from the Hebrew. When my heart said unto thee, let my face seek your face. That's another way of translating it. But the bottom line is, it's com connecting the heart to the face. So when my heart said, or my face said, you know, if it's my face saying it, it's saying connect our hearts. If it's my heart saying it, it's saying connect our faces. <laughs> um, is, that, is, that, is that relate to the countenance thing? And that relates to the countenance. Because the, the, what brain science calls the heart is the same thing that the, what the brain science calls the right brain, the Bible calls the heart. And the reason we know that is because it's the same four questions. And because it's 80%, 80%, 80% story in the Bible, 80% story in our right brain, really, because we, are, we run on storytelling. Mm -hmm. There was a Jewish lady, and this just came to me, who, who, who survived the um, Holocaust. And this is what she, she said. It's very profound. Uh, she said, uh, People, nations or peoples that are story-based are very hard to deceive. Yes. But nations or people groups that are intellect-based are easy to deceive. Because if you know the storyline, mm -hmm. and, and along comes a politician and tries to sell you, well, hey, that's not according, yeah, that's not according to the story. You know, yeah. we're not listening. Yeah. doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to, to, uh, to follow a storyline and see where something isn't working. And I, I wanted to say this, that the, the stories, people talk about translations of the Bible, you know, which one's the best. Well, when you translate a story, you, you don't miss much. <laughs> Other things that you translate, well, it could be this, it could be the story is a story. And you're going to have just about every point in there. And if you missed a word here or there, it's not really not going to mess up the story. OK. Q&A. <laughs> and if, if you have no questions, there's, we can look at something else that's kind of fun. But. Uh, there's another word for countenance. Uh, they say visage. Visage. That would be an excellent word. Visage, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. We're also thinking of harmony, uh, being in balance. There are a couple of things, ideas in that synchronization. Yes, um, yes. Yeah. Yes, so yeah, harmony, balance mm -hmm. in our visage. Right. And that's a part of us maturing as well from the standpoint, instead of thinking about 
like we was talking about mm -hmm. earlier about getting revenge or getting get back mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. someone, we're thinking how we can heal the relationship, yes. uh, you know, that kind of way. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. That's the mature thought. Our natural man is more eye for eye, tit for tat. Yes. In, yes, right. And, and, and that would be, let's just think of those rooms, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that would be room three, which is what, Enoch? The, the, well, the, as far as we use today. So it's our singular cortex? The kitchen. The kitchen. Okay. That's, that was our example. I already forgot. <laughs> so synchronization mm -hmm. in the kitchen. So uh, that's a huge step in maturity right. because you, you, you know what it's like if you're in a conversation and a person can't catch the drift yeah. of where you're going and what you're saying, mm -hmm. but they're, they're judging you by your exact words. Yeah. You know, woe unto him that judges by a word. Mm -hmm. So, but you said, <laughs> right. you know, such and such. Right. Now, that's an example of infant maturity because okay. an infant has to have something repeated back to them, at least once they learn to talk. <laughs> right. They have to have something repeated back to them in the exact words, you know, that's, you know, that's not my, you have many words for a cup, right? Cup, glass, right. Uh, vessel, whatever else we can come up with. Conservation. Yes, yeah, so, so you, it has to be my cup, mm -hmm. my red cup. Right. So this is, this is the way it is when we're speaking to infants, we have to use the exact words that they use, otherwise they're not able to generalize on, right. on the theme that we're discussing or the general uh, uh, point to be made. And they even have problems with uh, visual uh, continuity from yes. the standpoint uh, something can have eight ounces, but if it's shaped different, they think it has a different amount. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, this, is, this gets quite a rather challenging, right, when it's an infant in an adult body. Okay, I have two, two things. One, when Herbert was mentioning the understanding the maturity, doesn't maturity have to develop in a situation where you have bonds, whether they're natural bonds, maybe you have no family, but you have an older couple that are close to you like parents, or you have family at mm -hmm. church that's like, your siblings, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe you, you're married, maybe you're not. But to, to reach that level of maturity, we might be able to recognize it, but we don't have the, I think is the word joy, strength, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. achieve mm -hmm. that. And I know lots of people who then are very deep into God's word because they garnish from that, that level of understanding and... Yes. you know, support that they're not getting. But ideally, God has set up his churches, right? Yes, yes. To provide that interaction with each other and with people coming in. Let's talk about, just for a minute, this thing called joy strength that Amy mentioned. You remember the text in Scripture? It says, Thou hast anointed me with the oil of gladness above all thy brethren. The Psalms is talking about Jesus. Um, and we, people say, well, he had an advantage over us, or maybe he didn't have it, you know, this kind of a thing. He did have one advantage over us. Uh, uh, he, and that's saying the same thing as mm -hmm. he was anointed with joy, more joy strength than we have. Mm -hmm. So he, what is joy strength? Well, it's uh, in a practical way. Yes. It is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But a person filled with the Holy Spirit has the ability to get back to joy more quickly and easily than someone who doesn't have joy strength. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit from day one. <laughs> uh, now, what's th this fits in very well. What's the youngest emotion in Scripture? We just answered it. <laughs> the youngest emotion is joy. 
when Mary entered the room mm -hmm. and met Elizabeth, right? right? John the Baptist yeah. leaped in the womb. Nonverbal. Yes. So the, the joy <clears throat> was in, the, in its infancy, mm -hmm. but it was still joy. So, um, uh, if joy strength, the ability to be genuinely glad to be together, is greater than the stresses that we suffer in life, then we cannot be traumatized. If the stresses of life, the losses, whatever they are, are greater than our joy strength, then we'll be traumatized. And what is trauma again? It just means that I am unable to remain the same person that God intended me to be because of the stress. And so I, I'm no longer life-giving, I'm now death-giving. And yeah, Enoch, and Enoch knows all this with me. He can come up here and just uh, join in. Oh, sorry, Amy, yeah, you had a point. What I was it was is that uh, the joy is strength, it also depends how much joy you've received and how much joy you've had to put out in tough situations. Like suppose you had five days of work that was fulfilling and joyful, and then you get a phone call that a relative has died. Well, because of the five days beforehand, you're going to handle it. You know, grief is always terrible, but you're going to handle it better than if you hadn't had the five days beforehand. If you had three days of the good work beforehand, you'll handle that less well, but still okay. But if you had five days of stressful work with the boss yelling at you every day, and then you can't find the check that you need to cash to put gas in your car, then you get the call about the death. It could break you, you could be unable to function the rest of the day, you know. So basically the purpose of church is to put enough joy into you on Sabbath, so the rest of the week you won't get traumatized. That's right. I was just thinking about uh, when you was talking about resisting revenge or getting back at someone that if they, um, like he was saying, you have an, enough positive input mm -hmm. that enables you to deal with those struggles. There's something that's called epigenetics mm -hmm. that looks at how genes are turned on mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because of trauma. Mm -hmm. And God has built into us this resilience factor, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, they actually did research with the Holocaust victims. And they had great resilience. They, didn't, they, didn't have, they weren't subject to some of the illnesses that everybody who were having full diets and that kind of thing. And so sometimes God allows certain things to actually fortify us against assaults. So we have certain experience. You say, wonder why I had that experience is so that I can face something else down the road even mm. better. Yes, yeah. yes. Then, mm -hmm. Let me see, uh, Amy and then the pastor there. Uh, thank, yeah. I want to say thank you to that because that's exactly true. And when I do training for natural healing, we teach about epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And you can get that from herbs and foods, mm -hmm. and sunshine, and mm -hmm. fresh air, yes. <laughs> right, and rest, right. <laughs> and trust in God, <laughs> and water, right, that's all there, but um, the other thing we were talking about over lunch that I thought was really, in, um, it just triggered some thoughts, mm. is, is when we, we were discussing an individual that we know that we're praying for, and wanting to work with and bring to church and build relationships with. And this individual had trauma at a young age with a parent and then grew up, got married, was successful, built a life, attempted to build a life for themselves and then had a breaking of that marriage relationship. So two, two of those three bonds were broken and there is some discord in the family where they, this individual is not connecting at a sibling level. And so they're not connecting at any one of those three bonds. And they, although they're 
very, very educated and very, like, genius level intelligence, they're not functioning in life. And so our discussion, if you would go into how that's healed, because that's what I think, okay. that's what, this is a, um, an extreme example, right? Yeah. But this is kind of what we're looking at. We want to see people healed as Christians. Amen. We want to reach our community through our church, through our understanding of Christ. Yes, yes. Well, and we'll, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to take the pastor's comment, and then I'm going to, we'll, we'll look at, the, at this, the perfect pattern for healing, okay, from, from the Bible. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Second time that happens with me today. <laughs> Mics are against me. Um, so, I guess like uh, the the thing is that God made us to live in community, like with Him yeah. and with each other. Yes. yes. However, uh, although the community with each other is important, the, the one that we really need to have, and if we don't have that, everything crumbles, mm -hmm. is the community with God. Amen. And even like uh, that, uh, that stuff of like, uh, oh, okay, let's see, let's try to wait to like have more joy or less trouble, that's helpful, that's, it's a good orientation for us, humanly speaking. Mm -hmm. But the only true source of joy that can sustain us, as true and true, is God. Like, incidentally, I was reading this morning in Testimonies for the Church, uh, Volume 5, page 483, 484. The more a person's heart is in communication with God, in the more his affections are centered in Christ, the less he will be disturbed by the roughness and hardships he meets in this life. And then a little later, on page 488, it says, circumstances have little to do with the experience of the soul. It is the cherished spirit which God gives coloring to our, our, our actions. A man at peace with God and his fellow man cannot be made miserable. So that's uh, how God made us. And even with Trauma, and I dealt with patients with trauma, like, like when they, they are like on the bottom, they can't connect with everybody, with anybody. If we're lucky, he connects with you. <laughs> but uh, when they see that there is a God that's different than what he taught, and like once he started to share us that, through that, the other relationships are revealed. And then that what you're saying here comes true. That's true. How many of you have ever heard of the gentleman? Uh, he's, he's passed away now, but he was um, a pastor and evangelist, Bill Lehman. Bill, Bill Lehman. Um, uh, for many years, he pastored the Campus Hill Church in Loma Linda. And this is an interesting story. He told this story. He used to be a pilot. <clears throat> and uh, one day, the Lord tapped him on the shoulder and said, you know, you don't love people. And he said to the Lord, he says, yes, I do. And, you know, a week goes by, and no, you don't. He says, yes, I do. That went on for a couple of months. And so finally, after circumstances, in, in those uh, intervening weeks, he said, well, you know, I guess I, guess I don't. <laughs> so he started studying Christ, reading the book, Steps to Christ, and uh, Christ Object Lessons, and in his Art of Ages, of course. And something happened, of course, in his heart. And he was, <clears throat> when he got up to speak, it was obvious that there was love in his heart, and it became contagious. It's not that everybody was converted, but his heart was filled with joy, right? Glad to be with you. And there were, uh, of course, anywhere time you have interactions, there are people who are not glad to be with you. 
they don't quite don't know how to handle that if you're still glad with them, to be with them. He was able to synchronize with people and <clears throat> he formed permanent attachments, which is what we talked about. So the church grew. Uh, just um, it, that, it wasn't even a plan. It just, it just the spirit moved. Now, this is the thing that we're, we're living in a world where Satan is trying to do, in my mind, he's trying to do one thing, right? And that is to, to lower the maturity level until you have a society that's at infant maturity level. Right. And once society has reached infant maturity level, then they're not even able to listen to or either articulate or understand what's being articulated. And you have the French Revolution. So <clears throat> the only thing, the only language that they may know is what you know, God gave us, a people group, <laughs> in which we are, we form permanent attachments with people. The, the man who, who trained me, he said, and the, and the person he was trained by, it was something that, that always stuck in my memory. Because he was a psychologist, <clears throat> and you have someone who comes into your office, and you, you, know, you work with them, you give them advice, and so forth, but then the moment you step out of that room, you are not to acknowledge that you ever knew that person. So if you meet them on the beach, you meet them in the store, you just ignore them because you're not supposed to know them. So, the, the, and we call that being professional. So the man that trained him, he said, well, what, that was the question. He said, what do you do if you meet these people in public? And he said, well, they're my friends. He says, I have them over in my home. And, and that became his, his, his motto. So pro professional distance Sounds nice, and, and, and there's good reasons for it. But it tends to fight against permanent bonds, so God made, gave us a church. Now, maybe I'll say this. This is uh, uh, Amy, a little, maybe, maybe what you were asking. What is church? <laughs> it's a community of peoples? Believers. Believers? And what four things do they have? <laughs> Back to permanent bonds, glad to be with you, rest in their presence, group identity. Let's look, let's look at the Old Testament for just a minute. This is Numbers chapter 2, right? So Numbers chapter 2, if you just draw the picture, Numbers chapter 2 is, this, um, is the children of Israel, the way they're camped around. So the Lord says, let, you know, let me build a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So we think, well, yes, there was this tent that was built. But remember that the sanctuary is a tent. It's the people, and it's a person. So it's the children of Israel, but it's also this person, Jesus. So, and we're the temple. So it's all of the above. So these people were in this strange configuration, right? They were a square, and they had three on each side. That's how the 12 were divided up. Now, each of those sides was carrying a banner. And one was a banner of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Okay, and this is the face of God's people. And then we look at the book of Revelation and Ezekiel, and we have a lion, an ox, an eagle, and a man. So whatever this means, it means that whatever is here is, is a reflection of what's up here, because it's the same four corners, if you will. So we don't have a time to go into a, a full Bible study, but it's four faces, four creatures. What could they be saying? Well, what they're saying is a permanent attachment, a joy bond, a resting, building trust together, and acting out of our 
our individual and group identity. How do we know that? Um, okay, we'll just, we'll just, the man is the attachment, the lion from the tribe of Judah, joy strength, uh, or it could be the roaring lion, right? Fear bonds, the amygdala is joy or fear. The ox is, is that, does that creature roar? <laughs> no, it doesn't, it's, it's a quiet creature, but it's a strong creature. So the, the ox is known for, in its agriculture, it's the strong part. I'm just in the plow, but it's doing all the work. And that's synchronization. So we have a parent is like the ox, right, who's doing the strong work of lifting, you know, who's able to lift up the child out of these difficult emotion state, emotional states and is not... What's the word that I'm looking for? Not troubled by, it's a better word than that, is, is, not, uh, uh, is not controlled by the child. <laughs> okay? Uh, and it's an easy job to do because the parent has already been through all these stages and knows how to get back to joy from the six negative emotions, from anger, from fear, from disgust, from shame, from hopeless despair. And that's all human beings go through that. And the ego is the only creature that's, that has this, this, this three-dimensional <laughs> view. And so that is our, our individual identity. We know exactly where we fit in our group identity. So Jesus, he, he, his, his, his mind is working very, uh, it's not traumatized. So they're trying to trick him with questions. And he sees who he is. He sees who they are. He sees exactly how to relate, and there are so many options to pick from. He has no difficulty. You can't trap him. <laughs> because he was trained in the storyline. He, he knew the story of Israel. If, it was tr if we're trained in what's the right answer to the question, then we're, it's, wait a minute, you know, I'm going to get tricked up pretty quick. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trained in this right brain, what we call obedience. Right brain obedience is instinctive. Now, and we told the story of Joseph, I think last time I was here, how that all worked. Um, so the, the church below is like the one above. Now, this church below was a mess, <laughs> right? I mean, they, they pick up stones to, you know, anytime something goes wrong to, to, to stone Moses. But they're in this configuration that is that's saying one thing. It's saying, you stay in this configuration. And of course, it was literal. Mm -hmm. But even when they were settled in the land of Canaan, if that configuration was in their hearts, you stay in that configuration. You are staying within the family system in which these four levels of your right brain will be trained in, for lack of a better word, relational obedience, or like it says in Desire of Ages. You know, that when it's in our hearts to do right, we will, we will be, but uh, when, when we're carrying out our own impulses, we'll be carrying out the will of God. Yes, and of course, yes. you know, that's not, to be in, that's not to be interpreted, whatever I feel like doing, but it's saying, I'm being trained by these four, these four questions that are being answered in Christ. And when we come into that setting, we will mature. We don't have to, it's not like we're working on it, we will mature, children mature, and it's not by chance. It, the, the stronger the bond, the more capacity to return to joy, the more capacity to synchronize, the more capacity to develop my individual identity, a strong individual identity where I can't be moved. Um, and this is, this is God's gift he gave to us as a people. And so we live here in the United States, right? But we're not, we're not, uh, we're not, we don't have the same parents. But emotionally, we connect as brothers and sisters. Because our brain, our right brain, knows no difference between a biological bond and a spiritual bond. A spiritual bond is. Our right brain says, yeah, I feel like you're a brother or sister. Well, that's, that's who you are. <laughs> uh, and therefore, the rest of my processing can go to the next step. Say, now I can synchronize with you. That's what my understanding was, has been. 
That's what my understanding gotcha. has been is that we have people that are either in trauma or have experienced trauma. The healing comes through just acceptance and healthy relationship and allowing them to work through that along with, you know, of course, showing them God's word, showing them those stories, showing them who Christ is by, you know, treating them with that respect and then allowing them to explore that. Yes. But yes. that they have, you know, they can see it in who we are and how we interact. And I see Jesus in you. <laughs> yes. You know, oh, if that's who Jesus is, I like that. <laughs> and I want to know more. Yes. Uh, so Pastor. Again? <laughs> Very good. Uh, there's another aspect that's also important uh, that sometimes we neglect. Mm -hmm. What you said is correct. I'm not discounting. I'm just saying that there's something else that uh, our brain also syncs with each other by the mere proximity. Yes. Just for me, like sitting here on the pew yes. with Leroy, yes. even if I don't like him, I'm already synchronizing and absorbing things, and I'm going to go more and more with him, regardless if I like or not. That's why the Bible advises us not to even sit with the uh, people, like, I'm trying to remember the right words of Psalm 1 in English, like, uh, no, that, uh, blessed is the man, that, uh, oh, oh, that walk, that walk, yes. And then, what's the next step? Sits. Sits in the council of the ungodly. Yeah, sit yeah. with this corner yes. because he knows that the mere proximity mm -hmm. also causes that. And that's something that can be used by good when we do mm -hmm. intentionally loving others and like even trying to help and being close. That's why the, what, what some people call like the ministry of presence is so effective. You just need to be there sometimes yes. with the right intentions and the people get that. But... The other way around also works, so we have to be mindful of that. It's true. It's true. Let me share with you a personal story. Um, <clears throat> and um, when I was a child growing up, my father <clears throat> was not very good at synchronizing. Okay? So as a child, I'm formulating my ideas, and his response is, immediately while I'm formulating the idea to correct it. Mm. And I should have used this word instead of that word. Mm. Well, what do you think the, my response is? Yeah. You know, well, then I better not try. Mm -hmm. And my father had uh, a, a poker face. So to me, that looked angry. OK, so this is training the amygdala that we talked about to look for angry faces. So whenever I see what at least looks like an angry face, because our right brain, when, it's, when it sees something bad and scary, it has two responses, and that is to move toward it for a fight or move away <clears throat> in, in fear. But it's, if, if, it's, if it's sufficiently bad and scary, the right brain will shut down the left brain. So the things that you are thinking about are going to disappear. So you ever have this experience, you're in someone's presence, and they're a very powerful person. And you're thinking to yourself, well, I, I know the answer to that, but I can't think of it. Wow. You know, it's just, uh, and, and if, if this is formed early in life, then that happens over and over again for, throughout our lives. So we have to think, well, how do we re get that repaired? So, <clears throat> Uh, uh, the Lord can repair it, but it is, it, this is a subcortical, it's beneath conscious level. So before I'm conscious of it, it's already shut off. And, and what happens is, is that this part of my brain that we talked about earlier today, that I derive my identity from, well, what it's doing is it's saying, what does it like me to do in this situation? So it pulls out, opens a drawer, pulls out tapes, and I, it just runs the tapes of what I've done all the time. And this happens in a sixth of a second. And consciousness does not come on until a fifth of a second. 
That's 30, 30th of a second later. So I'm already in motion doing what I, like Paul says, not what I want to do. And by the time my left brain comes on and says, you know, that's not really what I want to do, but I just did it, right. it's too late. So this is the point I'm making. Number one, who would want to get to that part of my brain early in life? Satan. Satan. So he wants to traumatize the thalamus and the amygdala before I'm able to mature. So he can say, well, you know, he, he can he say, well, I, I can just yank that chain anytime I want. And then <clears throat> I learn, you know, from Scripture, I learn the Ten Commandments, I learn the principles, and yet, you know, years go by, I'm still doing the same thing. So, like I said, I think it was on Friday, the, the good news, the bad news is that our right brain fires before our left brain. The good news is that our right brain fires before our left brain. <laughs> okay? So how do we fix the part of the brain that you can't reason with? And this is where God calls us, <laughs> peoples, together. Because <clears throat> this is an amazing experiment, and of course, this is biblical. What was the reason why, why do we bring the widows and the orphans into our home kind of a situation, you know, in, in, into fellowship? You know, the, they have no parents, not only to protect, but for their right brain to capture what it's like me and my people to do in the different situations of life. So my right brain gets wired according to the pattern that I'm exposed to. So <clears throat> uh, in a very short time, if we, are, if we are transported into a healthy home, as an adult, within a very short time, our brain can pick up what it looks like. Because I have no idea, if, I wasn't, if my brain didn't pick it up as a child, no idea what to do. So let's go back to the time of Christ, right? The, the people who are hanging around him, they're watching how he's responding, and their brains are picking it up, and of course, especially the disciples, right? Three and a half years. So after three and a half years of watching what it's like me and my people, which would be Jesus, <laughs> to do. And then the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, uh, has permission to do some rewiring. <laughs> okay. Um, and they remember what it was, what Jesus did. And they, it becomes something that they want to do. You know, rather than to be prejudiced rather than to be spiteful. This is, we saw how he did this. Well, my brain has a track in it. I know how to do that now. It's like riding a bicycle. You know, I, I can tell you what I'm doing, but I, I, you, you won't be able to do it until you do it. <laughs> because it's muscle memory. So it's the same thing. The cingulate cortex and the right prefrontal cortex is, what, we'll call it muscle memory for the sake of illustration. But we're, we're learning what it's like me to do. This is the, um, uh, when I, one thing always says the next thing. <laughs> I'll just stop here. Our left brain says, what should I do in this situation? Okay? So the situation comes, and when the enemy comes in like a flood, it's too fast for me to think of scripture and verse, the exact thing I'm supposed to, I can't, I can't think that fast, and if it's a little traumatizing, I won't think of anything. But it says, the Lord lifts up a standard against him. Well, there are four standards, the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man. Those are the standards. And what is that standard? The right brain says, not what should I do, but what is it like me and my people from above to do? OK? So, so what, how we react to one another is building that part of the brain that seats me in the heavenly places that I know what my people above would do. And we learn that as we read from scripture and practice within our own faith and beliefs. Yes, yes. We read the scripture and then we practice it. 
Uh, otherwise, it's just theory. So and, and we have automatic practice. What is your answer then to the individuals that we can tell need help, but they're persistent not to change? Doesn't that speak to, because I think as the pastor was mentioning, what he's mentioning about not being around people that are negative, that's a good boundary, right? That's right. what we're talking about when we say good boundaries. We have to have good boundaries because we're not helping people if we feel so bad for them. We give them money instead of food when they're starving because they take the money and go buy alcohol. So. Severely broken is a category that often exceeds the joy strength, and we're talking about our people, maybe the joy strength of the church, severely broken. It's the devil, what he's trying to do is to always put us into contact with the severely broken and we don't, when we don't have capacity. So then we're gonna feel guilty. And it's not that it's our, it's not that it's, it's our duty to judge, <clears throat> but if, uh, if we work with what we have, <laughs> God bless us. He, mul he does the multiplying. Uh, it's, uh, if we grow, there's two ways of growing, right? We can grow using left brain techniques or we can grow using right brain techniques. And I use the word techniques, but it's not really the best way to say it. So if, if we grow the right brain by practicing, like, like Amy said, practicing what we read in scripture, uh, that will start to spread. And then, of course, if we're all doing this, the joy strength of the whole group will rise the maturity of the whole group will rise, and that will actually automatically take care of the severely broken situation. Because what it's up to the Holy Spirit to arrange. So you have a person comes in, and God has selected that person. The group is now mature enough, let's say, to handle the severely broken. I'm going to say, I'll start with one person. Because no one person can handle, except Jesus, a severely broken person. They'll take you down. They'll just you know, move into your house and, and uh, uh, the, the, everything is so unregulated that, that nothing else will function. But save a drowning person. So only a healthy group can handle that kind of situation. Now here's, here's the other problem. You can have a very well polished person come in, but that person is sociopathic, <laughs> uh, narcissistic. narcissistic, okay? Severely and broken. Severely broken at the top end. <laughs> 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 and Satan, you know, have, uh, Satan loves both ends. We have the unborn and we have the unbroken. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's very good. <laughs> the unbroken. Well, well, this is solved in the book of Acts. If we, if, uh, the, if we raise the joy strength, right, which, which we've talked about, um, <clears throat> let me say it this way. We cannot have meaningful attachments without vulnerability. Yes. Okay? And so... Now, that's why the church is, 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 has a, is, is a feminine idea, right? It's, it, what's happening is the enemy is coming to exploit vulnerability. And so family by nature is vulnerable. And so you have you know, the sociopath, the psychopath, the devil, the ultimate one, right? He's, he's looking for now which, which gate, which of the 12 gates can I get in? Which of those four faces, which one of those four areas, the four rooms of the house, can I get in because the door's open. Yeah. But a sociopath, psychopath too would be worse, but that, uh, if the joy strength is high, what that means is that these people cannot afford to be vulnerable. That's, the, that's, that's like their worst fear, right? So, if the joy strength is high, you know, among the among among the people, because the we have appropriate vulnerability, we're brothers and sisters, 
So I, I can share my, my struggles and, and what the Lord is doing in my life. But because I'm a human being, I haven't overcome everything. <laughs> but you, you can identify, and there's something that might be helpful to you, and then you share there's something helpful to me. And I'll, I'll tell you something we've done in the past that's really a real blessing. Uh, well, I'll tell you now, and then we'll come back to the example. We had a group meet for fellowship in, in our home, and it was kind of a fun thing to do. And I, I wish we're, we're doing it now, right? It just got interrupted. And that is, <clears throat> uh, we had maybe a, a three, four couples, and we would, each time, each week we would meet, and we would give the hour to one person to tell their story without interruption. Isn't that cool? Yes. And so after they had told their story, we gather around, we pray for them. And then the next week, next person. And then when you finish, you know everybody uh, at, a, at a more intimate level. And there's no way because the bonds that are formed, that you're going to expose that person's life to, to the, to the non-family, right? Because it's, it's right, automatic confidant. And so that's a sample. It, and the leader basically, uh, uh, what's the word, sets the pattern, right? Again, there has to be the leader, there has to be a level of maturity to do this. That group cannot have a sociopath in it <laughs> to begin with. Okay, you know your people. So then, <clears throat> uh, in a church environment where you've, you, you've reached this, I'll, I'll call it critical mass, right? Where you're, you're appropriately vulnerable, the bonds are tight. In comes a person who's sociopathic. They cannot stand being in a group identity that is vulnerable. So they're not coming in. <laughs> It's an automatic, and and that was in the book of Acts, right? It's this is my this is the Stokes's translation of the book of Acts. It's just the joy strength of the group was so high that those that wanted that tried to join without a, without desiring conversion could not. I mean that's that's the the, the that's how the church was kept pure. Um, uh, you didn't have to seek these people out. They would automatically eliminate themselves. Yeah, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be naked. <laughs> it's, vulnerability is nakedness. If we build trust, yeah. And, uh, and, and I think some... I, sometimes we would eat, right, Enoch? Sometimes we'd have supper or something like that. Other times we didn't uh, in the group. But in other words, we didn't... Food adds to the bonding, but you don't have to have it. And I think we were enjoying this so much, people didn't care about food. Uh, and so uh, we thought of each other as brothers and sisters because of the bond. We were overcoming fear with joy. We were learning to synchronize. And we were creating a group identity that was enhancing our individual identity. So just those four again. And that's wherever that happens, that's, that's church. So wherever Jesus went, those four things were happening. That was church. To, to, mobile church. <laughs> uh, same with, with Abraham and Moses, mobile church. Would that be similar to if all of all of the individuals or a majority of the individuals in a setting were um, were converted or just felt that closeness when someone else would I'm gonna use an example like gossip, they would say, I you know, I just I don't want to hear that. <laughs> you know? We can, let's pray for that person, but don't tell me that, you know, that's, to, that's information that is, you know, inappropriate for me to hear. I'm not comfortable. Without being mean about it, they could kindly say, you know, I just don't want to hear it, but since you brought it up, let's go over here and take a minute, and we'll pray together for them. And that would, that would curtail, for example, gossip, which tends to be 
one of the things that eats away at a congregation. Yes, yes. And if, if, we, uh, if we had formed these bonds, the moment someone, uh, we'll say outside, right, whatever that means, someone outside starts to whisper about that person, you say, no, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I know them. I've known them for 12 weeks or whatever, you know, the length of time. They are my brother. They are my sister. And I'm going to do everything I can to protect them because I know their story. And because I know their story, there's no way you're completely misjudging them based on one thing that, that, that you observed. Uh, yeah, and I've had many an embarrassing thing in my life that, you know, as I think about it, uh, uh, because of gossip. Conversion, you know, a complete conversion to the, the, uh, the teachings of Christ. How does that fit into this hmm. scenario? Because wow. it, it, those same four examples are also, are they, are they also signals or, or indications of conversion? Hmm, hmm, I like that. Uh, we just read Psalms 27, right? My face... Uh, uh, was it my heart set unto your heart or, my, did it, or was it my face set unto your face? Uh, uh, when you said, seek my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Or my heart said, let my face seek your face. So I think conversion is a turning away from our, you know, our own way and we're turning toward God. So this idea of our face turning toward God it's turning toward them, it's four faces, turning toward God. Uh, now, he's happy if, if he just gets one, for starters, <laughs> right? And uh, uh, if he has just one face, which is forming an attachment, then the other faces you know, are, are almost instantaneously right there. Uh, so conversion is... Uh, uh, Yes, it's a decision we make, but the quiet part that we often are not thinking of is what the right brain is doing long before that. We're being drawn, right? That's the right brain. We're being drawn by likeness that's attractive to us. That, that was the whole purpose of the children of Israel, was that the, the, the four faces, but especially the likeness to their God was so attractive that I like that, I want that. You know, everything, you have order here, but you're not micromanaging people. You, there's, you know, you're, you know, to Solomon in his early reign, right? You're a king, but you're treating people like a older brother. Everyone has their own land. Everyone has their own autonomy in which they can grow families and have their own, you know, their own property, their own fig tree. And, and maybe this is where I would interject this. The beauty of the United States, the way we were founded was, our country is a country of brothers and sisters. You know, it, it's, you could say that it's a church. You know, if you, you, you know what I'm saying? You, you know what I'm not saying, right? <laughs> I'm saying that the people came to this country and they said, well, you know, I'm going to change my name because I'm an American now. <laughs> and what does that mean? It means that I'm going to share the group identity with everyone else. And where I came from is less important. But it's who I'm with. That's what's important. So, the, so our, uh, this country, at a visceral, at a right brain level, was to create a system of brothers and sisters. And then God called a church in the midst of this sibling bond called the Adventist church. And that church was to bring us up to the marriage bond. We were gonna, it was to bring us to the next level of intimacy. Uh, but we had to first have the sibling bond for it to work because otherwise you know, we wouldn't have, a president is really an, is an elder, right? It's just an older brother. That, 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 that's the, now we have, we're moving toward imperial presidency. But, 
It's not a king. It wasn't supposed to be a king. It was supposed to be a mature brother who carried the country in their heart, which is what we would call betting the farm. Uh, that person is trusted with the rest of our hearts. He was, he was, the person was born here. It's part of us. Uh, and so the, the, the purpose is, you know, families can grow. Mm -hmm. Families can mature. Uh, that's what everyone really wants. That's what God, the enmity that he put in our hearts was we want to be, we want to develop in the image and likeness of God. We want to have, we want to have three bonds to grow a family and, what, the pursuit of happiness? <laughs> we want to network and just build larger family environments in peace. Now, obviously, you have narcissistic, you have all the rest of these, and then you have to have a civil government to take care of that. But, but freedom, freedom to become a people group is our God-given right. Uh, and it will, at the highest level, because we're called, to the, we're called to the highest level of spouse bond, it will give us the freedom to develop to a, a maturity that cannot be traumatized. Uh, it has yet to be demonstrated. But, you know, the spirit of prophecy talks about love, when we're able to love our enemies, and I cannot produce that. It's impossible. But I can be in a group where, <clears throat> in our vulnerability, my brain will be prepared to receive the, the, that capacity to forgive even while I'm being rejected. But that has to be something that my right brain learns. Now, the, <clears throat> the, the problem, the big problem we're dealing with is is this issue of the enemy coming in like a flood. Our right brain has to be prepared for the flood. <laughs> and this maybe is where the story of Joseph comes in. Right? How, uh, how was he prepared to meet the temptation from Potiphar's wife? You remember that? Yes. It, uh, the, we're, with God. We're told that Potiphar's wife multiple times tempted him until finally she had the opportunity to grab his, his, his cloak. But what does his brain do? You remember that? His, the first part, his right brain says, what's the, what is the bond here? Parent, child, sibling, or spouse? Okay. It is a sibling bond. It's not a spouse bond. And so then if she's coming after me, as a spouse bond, but this is a sibling bond, my amygdala says, bad and scary. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so, <laughs> bad and scary. And what do I do when it's bad and scary? Run. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, it, it, I, I'm in no condition to synchronize. Okay? So that's... Uh, and, and so, the... The synchronization circuits are handling, you know, disgust. You know, there's six of them, right? Sadness, shame, uh, 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 fear, and I, Enoch, you remember them. I don't remember them. Hopeless despair and anger. Thank you. <laughs> I have to do it in a certain order, like A, B, C, D, and I don't get it. Uh, so, so my. My king, sink of the cortex is saying disgust. So d disgust means that's not life giving. Yeah. And so we have fear and we have disgust firing. Mm -hmm. And then what is it like me and my people to do? Okay? It's like me and my people to retreat, to run. <laughs> and then because my left brain doesn't turn on until after I'm in motion, then Joseph gets out, you know, at a distance, wherever he is, and then his left brain says, you know, I, sh I forgot something back there, <laughs> and that doesn't look good. <laughs> and why didn't, I th why didn't I think of that on my way out, you know? Okay. So we call that right brain obedience. Okay, that, that's, that's the desire of ages. 
Is it 668, I think? That's, that's impulsive obedience. It's, did Joseph have time to think of, you know, chapter and verse? No. no. I mean, the Ten Commandments weren't written then, but the principle was there. And even if it was written, he doesn't have time to think about that. The only thing he has time to do is react. And he's in sync with his father. And he's in sync with his father. And he sees his, you know, he's seeing his father's face through this method that the Bible is, is referring to. So this is... <clears throat> This is what God wants to build into us through community, is this what we call impulsive obedience. And of course, growing up, I missed a lot of those pieces. And so uh, Enoch, Enoch and I, we talk about this. This is God is in the process of strengthening and building community. We don't see it, but we can be assured that he's doing it because we know the devil's busy. So the decision the main decision we can make is that I, I'm committed to maintaining and growing the bond between my brothers and sisters. Because that's the same circuit that grows. There's, there's no other circuit in my brain. It's the same one that's vertical, and I'm automatically doing this one. And, and when I'm reading the Bible, my brain is built better to, to see him because of the connection that I'm already experiencing on a horizontal level. You know. There's something else that we should add. Is that, uh, yeah. Pretty good voice, though. Um, that when you are looking at God, it's important to see him as a father, you know, as a parent. Because that first room of your brain, the foyer, the thalamus, can only attach to a parent or a sibling or a spouse. So if you don't see God as one of those three, if you don't feel close to him relationally, that just as a king, then by definition, you cannot receive any love from God, even if you spend hours a day in the scripture. Because I've experienced this. You see, when you read the scripture, the prerequisite to that is having some level of right brain function that you've learned from your parents or from your siblings. And in my experience, you know, things I missed growing up because I was focused on just pure intellect. I missed some of that, so when I read the scripture, I learned information, but it didn't do anything for my sense of closeness to God often. And this is four hours a day in scripture, seven days a week for years. So the scripture without attachments to other people doesn't do as much good as you might think because the devil reads the scripture more than you do but it's not doing him any good. Why? Because he broke his attachment with his father, who was God the Father. And so without that information, it's just used in a destructive way. That's what a psychopath or a sociopath does. So we have to emphasize you need both a scripture and you also need community. Without community, your brain will lose the wiring that it needs in order to comprehend the scripture or anything else. Because we're meant to comprehend everything relationally with these four rooms. And because I've personally experienced all four rooms being broken, I know how it is to go through all kinds of experiences in life, time with friends, reading the scripture, praying, everything is dry. Everything feels lifeless, like an engine with no oil. It doesn't start. Everywhere you go, it's kind of like when those four levels are off, every experience feels like fingernails on a chalkboard and there's no way out. Talking to people, eating, trying to go to sleep, reading the Bible, every activity you can name, fingernails on the chalkboard. Because to have joy in an experience requires that sense of connection to somebody, yeah. and the sense of joy, and the sense of synchronization, weep with those that weep, rejoice with those that rejoice, mm -hmm. in a place where you can be yourself, because when the first three rooms are running, in the foyer, the living room, and the kitchen, then you become aware of what your preferences are. You know, I've had experiences where there was powerful people that redirected me into a direction, into a direction I didn't really want to go in, but I went because in their presence I couldn't remember what I wanted anymore. 
It's like a person with their eyes closed and you ask them, what do you see in front of you? Well, they can't see anything. So all I knew was the logical solution, which was they may have more information for me and I like information, so maybe I'll add some more information to this. But the information ended up being painful or destructive because their presence caused me to, I could say it as forget who I was, or I could say it as I lost the ability to know what I wanted. And then when what I wanted came back online, days later I realized I fell for this and now I've injured myself by my own choice, you know. See, this happens to a lot of people. It's like, why did I make that stupid mistake again? Well, it could be because you were in a situation where your amygdala saw the person as bad and scary. Their face was a poker face, or it was scary, or they were very powerful, and or they reminded you of a scary person from when you were younger that first shut off that amygdala. And then in that experience, you find yourself running a tape of, I'll do whatever it takes to please them. And the Bible says, have no other gods before me. That should be the end of people pleasing because your primary person to please is God. And if this person you're trying to please is not attaching to you first in the family system, then they're by definition an abuser, you know. And it doesn't matter whether the information they're giving you is spiritual or not. By the laws of the mind, it is still abusive because it's putting in the right information into the wrong place in your brain because it's going in without those levels being on, without that attachment. I've experienced that too, you know. I feel strongly about this because I've experienced, you know, lots of mental pain, depression, panic attacks, feeling as if I didn't belong to humanity. I've been through it all, no exaggeration. So everything that my dad's talking about, as far as these levels and how they work, I have lived with all four broken at the same time. Negative emotions, I felt all six simultaneously to where I wanted to die. My dad can tell you this is absolutely true. And I've also, you know, lived in coming out of it and having, you know, the joy of a sense of connection. So I appreciate these things that are really important, you know. Without attachments, beautiful mountains, money means nothing. We need to have the sense of joy and to make people feel, I love you because you exist. Whatever weaknesses you have, whatever may be your issue, it's irrelevant because you are still my brother and sister, you know. And like we also said, do it within, within your capacity, you know. When I was in Hawaii, I spent six weeks with somebody who was psychotic, trying to reparent them. Because I said, God, I want you to give me something hard and I want to see if I can win with this. Mm. And I was able to get him from where he could barely speak to where he was a lot more functional. Constant level one attachment, you know, for like 14 hours a day for six weeks. So uh, this is not, you know, an average level job, you know. This is the kind of level that would crack some people within a few hours, you know. But uh, I don't know exactly, you know, what special gifts I may have, but I just persisted because I've learned with my brain being broken, when it gets rebuilt, it gets rebuilt stronger, which means a person who can scream at me for two hours and my amygdala doesn't even register that there is a threat, you know. When I drive, you know, I have no fear of hitting another car because I've had a gun pointed at me and I knew God would protect me. So there's things, you know, that my brain can do, you know, that some people's can't, you know. When you lose, you often build back stronger, or, you know, or build back better to be a bit humorous. But uh, just saying that this is something that God, you know, can train us to do, you know, to help people who are severely broken when we're ready. But don't do it before you're ready, otherwise you could be in a dangerous situation, you know. But I tell you, any mental illness people have, anything people have that has gone wrong, if you have community around them and you turn up the joy high enough, you can fix anything. Demon possession, schizophrenia, doesn't matter what it is, you know. Everybody has the same issue, some kind of brokenness in these four levels. So I just want to tell you that, you know, whatever people have in society, God's going to use this church to fix them. And whatever you have broken in you, God can fix it with community. You may have to wait. You may not know when, but, you know, you have no need to worry about if because God can bring the solution and, you know, we're all going to have whatever's broken in us healed. I guarantee you, you know. So there is hope for everything through community and then you'll understand God better, the Bible better, 
everything better, you know, because God, you know, is meant to be the eyes that we look through. So, thank you. Mm. Thank you, Enoch. So, you know what I'm going to say, Enoch? <laughs> I, I think that the schizophrenics and the bipolar and the diseased people need to be medicated. And then they're welcome to join in a church that is a safe mm -hmm. and loving environment where they can grow and learn. And hopefully, by through God's grace and the love from mm -hmm. people, you know, pe you're right. They can find a safe regulation. Um, but I, I think there is a practical application in all that, wouldn't you say, Keith? Yeah, and, and let me respond to what Enoch was saying. This is, you know, the, in the last days, God's going to send Elijah the prophet to yeah. turn the hearts of the fathers to their to sons, is that right? Yes. Of course, that would include mothers and daughters, right? Yes. It's ge generic. Um, and this is, if we look around, we, we're seeing this both in the secular world and the church. We're seeing reconciliation taking, not everywhere, I mean, not everybody. We're seeing reconciliation taking place, and that's the step that the Holy Spirit's working. And so, uh, Enoch and I, we went through a period we were estranged, yeah. you know, uh, and after my wife passed away, you know, again, I won't know till eternity, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it, we've had opportunity to bond, you know, in, in ways that may not have been possible, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is the way it worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in the bond, uh, God is healing. <laughs> you know, and so our our relationship is just getting better and better and better. <laughs> and, and it's healing both of us. Yeah. So, yeah, this is, to us, it isn't just a theory in a book. <laughs> this is, you know, this is something we're walking out every day. Uh, May I say something? Pastor, yeah. Uh, it's just a uh, thing that I think needs to, to be said as well. Two things, actually. One uh, is regarding one thing that's clear on the Bible, but sometimes we forget, how the human bonds, they are just uh, like um, aids, like a, like a walking stick mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to teach a ch uh, children, ch teach the children to really know uh, how to relate with the father. Mm -hmm. Why? Because God in the Bible, he's not only the father, he's our brother. Yes, yes. And he's our husband. Yes. Our yes. wife. Yes. Like a, yes. He's our spouse. Yes. And uh, that's the ultimate relationship we are designed to. And the others are like just aids. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what I'm saying this, because there's a lot of people that are, uh, Sometimes they hear messages about wedding, marriage, or reflecting the image of God, and this and that, and, and they look to themselves. Oh, I'm single, or I, don't, I can't have attachments because whatever, like mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. a subject that's kind of taboo, but like let's say sexual orientation because I don't like, mm -hmm. and so I prefer to be single. So. Sometimes they think, how can I have that, that fulfillment? You can have with God. Amen. He, can he can be your father, he can be your brother, and he can be your spouse. Yes. And uh, through that, mm -hmm. you can uh, get it. When you are a kid, that's a hard pill to swallow. You cannot really because kids don't process in that way. They are not mature enough, so they have to look for the role models. And through their parents, they see how God is on that function. Through their siblings, they see how God acts on that level. And uh, as they grow up a little bit, when they start to fall in love, through the, then they can see that aspect mm -hmm. of uh, God too. But as you get to adulthood... Uh, that's why, uh, like, uh, in uh, the therapeutic relationship, yes. uh, I always counsel, like, uh, 
uh, psychologists and people to point to those three relationships through Christ. Because he can fulfill all those voids. Yeah. Because usually when people are in, at, after a certain level of brokenness, like they really cannot feel safe yes. with their parents that abuse them mm -hmm. or with their siblings or with whatever. Like the world is an enemy. They are yes. in the process that everything is against them. So, yes. yeah. so that's yeah. why that aspect is very important. Very important. The other thing that I want to talk is like uh, we talk a lot uh, about uh, relationships and this and that, how we can get better. But we also forget something that's also very present, very biblical, very there. That's the power of habituation. Yes. Okay. We are what we love mm -hmm. and, we lo and we love what we do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the things that we keep doing, keep we create mental patterns that, like, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. as, that are as strong as the ones that we see. Yes. And uh, at some point in our healing process, and we all need healing, uh, we need to recognize which are those bad patterns that I'm, and start a process of habituation to the other direction. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. both things, they have to go in tandem. Yeah. Otherwise, you can have all the relationships you you want and need, right. but if you don't change your patterns, right. mm -hmm. you'll mm -hmm. get in trouble. Thank you. That's right. Absolutely. Yep. No, don't think I have anything to add. To Just about gone an hour and 45. <laughs> um, Let's. Something I'm getting from the whole presentation is that that shared emotional state mm -hmm. where we learn trust, and especially people who've been traumatized. That's like the hardest thing to do, but we reinforce. Um, you know, that middle level, yeah. I think mm -hmm. the synchronization, we reinforce that through what the pastor's talking about, the, the habit, mm -hmm. you know, we, we keep the Sabbath holy, all these shared values, and all of that reinforces our ability to, to uh, be vulnerable and to, you know, to share mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And, and uh, it's so important to be able to trust, because yes. a lot of yes. us have all these walls and like Pastor was saying, we look at all others enemies or something to be conquered, you know. Right, right. And so that's something I got from the presentation is that that is just being able to share is a is a is a gift from God as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you know, so, uh, mm. one thing I would say just so that we're, it's easy, of course, to be misunderstood when when you're emphasizing one thing. The danger is, is that people think you're de-emphasizing another thing. <laughs> okay, so we've, if we've grown up, let's say, as, uh, first of all, if we've grown up in the church, right, or if we've grown up as Christians, or we've grown up moral, let's say, whatever, <clears throat> uh, we, uh, we, we spend a lot of time in our very cerebral, in the, the right things and the wrong things to do. And I, we're not saying that's wrong. We're, what we're saying is that this side we've never talked about, so we're just taking the time to talk about it. But it doesn't mean that we don't believe in this right. <laughs> on, the, on the left side. Uh, and I would, I, would, uh, I, would, I would say that... <clears throat> uh, the 80% that we don't talk about, we don't have to spend 80% of, of the time talking about it, but at least we should have a few minutes to talk about it because it's so, it's so vital in our, in our maturity. And I like how it ties into the whole gospel narrative. Like the woman called it adultery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. It's not that he's soft on crime. 
He's just exactly. dealing with her as a family member. And so when you're in the family, yeah. we working by house rules. And so no matter what you like did, that. you you not you still my son or you still my relative, my That's sibling, good. you know. And yeah. so we we learned to accept Yes. Because you can make mistakes like you was presenting earlier, and, but that still doesn't put you out of the house, out That's, of the rooms. Yeah. I, I, like, I like that uh, term, house, the house rules. Yeah. yeah. Our, yeah. helping me in order to understand this is how do we get to a place in in our community our church where um we are we we, we reach that level of vulnerability trust mm -hmm. where we can we can adequately deal with issues that people may may face mm -hmm. and but because of because of taboos because we don't want to open up to because of um, you know we, we, we don't want to bear our souls to have people judge us and so fear forth of fear of fear of being ostracized how can we as a church move beyond that because otherwise if we if, to me if we just come here and we and we and we keep these things harbored inside ourselves and we smile from week to week and we just we, we're just dealing with each other at a surface level you know mm -hmm. and, how do we move beyond that? Where we really, truly, truly are ex become yeah, become vulnerable. You know? but, but here, here's, a, here's a step. Uh, remember that the right prefrontal cortex is, <clears throat> is directing our pathway. I mean, the Holy Spirit is, is, is speaking through all four of these, these, these rooms, let's say, in our brain. Uh, when you walk into a schoolroom, what is it like you to do? What do you think it's natural for you to do if you're in a schoolroom, as opposed to being in someone's home? If I walk into a schoolroom, be prepared for a lecture, <laughs> take, to take notes, right? If I walk into your home, what are the, what are the house rules, <laughs> right? The house rules are, I'm here to see you. That's right. That's right. I'm here to have fellowship with you in your territory. Yes. And so <clears throat> the, the structure itself is saying to our right brain, ah, I'm home. Right. You know, but when I walk into a classroom, the structure, that's, that's, well, this is the right brain. Okay. I, I mean, what takes place in the classroom is left brain, yes, yes. mostly, right? Mm -hmm. But my right brain, when I walk into that environment, says, you know, I'm not here for relationships. I'm here to learn information. Mm -hmm. And so, and you know, there's no furniture in there. There's just chairs and a desk up front. So it just shuts me down relationally. So what's the solution in that, in that illustration? Well, from the, I don't know if I have the solution, but I'm saying from that illustration, we generally have been treating church like school rather than home. And so that has been a failure, I think, because we lead with the rules and you know, the law mm -hmm, mm -hmm. before we deal with relational aspects. And so we've been treating the church like the schoolhouse rather than a home. Yes. Because this is the house of God. And so that might be, start, that might be the start to start reframing that the narrative, what we're thinking about a home rather than just instruction. Let me share with you, with you what happened when my wife was, was dying. And I think I shared this before, but for those of you who haven't heard it. People came, so uh, at the last six weeks of her, her life, she died of, of bladder cancer. But the last six weeks, people came from all the churches, you know, there are many churches there in Marion Springs. So we had uh, the, uh, the grocery lady, you know, the, the, at the uh, bag of groceries. We had a uh, farmer and his wife, we had a lawyer and his wife, we had a doctor and his wife. We had uh, a, uh, um, 
uh, an accountant. You know what I'm saying? Just every walk of life. In their pajamas. Wow. Okay? Because they, they wanted to give... And, and I didn't ask them to come. You know, their, their Sabbath schools made the announcement and, and they, they came. And because they were in different churches, they didn't know each other. But uh, the, the room that my wife was in was probably, you know, about from here over to here. It's a large room and just, just her bed. And uh, we'd moved her from upstairs bedroom. And so what, what are they doing? We're, we're, everyone's sitting there on the floor, you know, just the lights are low, talking, sharing stories. My, my wife is slipping into unconsciousness. Uh, and <clears throat> I said to myself, does it take death for us to do this? Why can't we do this? Why do we have to, why do we have to be in, in this? Yeah. It, and the professions that we were made no difference. We were just people. So uh, I, what I, I think of the text that says, when Christ ascended on high, he gave gifts unto men. You know what I think those gifts were? You know what I think those gifts were? You and me. He gave us to each other. That was the gift. Now, of course, he gave himself to us. Of course. But to make it real, he gave us to each other. And so when the church met, you know, the early church, they met every day. Now, I mean, that may not be convenient. Yeah, it may not be convenient in our society, but uh, I remember growing up, my dad and I and my brother, we would ride bicycles. This was in South Lancaster when the college was running. And we'd, we'd ride our bicycles, and we'd pull up to somebody's house, yeah, and we know who was there. We, we didn't make an appointment to come. We just were here wow. and wow. come in. And it was just, this was back in the 1950s. So we, you know, nice days. <laughs> but this, this ability to just drop in, and there are people now that will stop by the house and they, they just know that the door is open. Wow. Just come in. Now, you know, again, once in a while, that has gotten abused. But that's a rarity. Uh, because it's saying, when they come to visit, it's saying it's important. Now, here's the other thing I, that, that happened. There was, a, the, there was a doctor who I didn't know very well. He came to, to check out my wife. After my wife passed away, he said to me, he said, what are you doing every day? Just tell me about your life. And I said, well, I think, I think I'm doing OK. I'm, you know, I'm keeping busy. He says, no, no, this is, that's not what I'm asking. He says, I'm asking, are you seeing people? <laughs> I said, no, I guess not. He says, not good, not good. He said, from now on, yeah. on every Wednesday, he says, you come over to my house. And you come over, he says, he says, I get home at 5 o'clock. He says, you come over. You don't, he says, you don't have to. But you just come over and do whatever you want to do. You can join us for supper. You can you know, go to the bedroom. You can cry. You can do whatever. He's just, just, this is your place. So then I said to myself, I think the Lord's speaking to me. Why don't I call people that I know? And I'll ask one of them, can I if I need to, can I come over to your place on a Wednesday night? And I call another, can I come over to your place on a Tuesday night? I might not come, but can I? And you know what they did? Well, they're in a state that after the funeral, they're like, I don't know if we should bother him. But now I'm saying, can I? Of course, we'd love to. You know? So then I would stop, if I needed, I would stop other nights at these other homes. And guess what? These are people that normally didn't get visitors. <laughs> and it was like they were honored, and, and, I, and I needed it. So um, th th these, are those, these are the rules, the unwritten rules of community, where, uh, again, you know, I think we are mature enough to not be taking advantage of these things. We're, we're, I mean, we're so far over on this side, right, that we're not even close. So 
uh, to do these things, this, when we go into a home, it's more community than going into an academic setting. So the academic setting is good, but we need the home environment. So, you know, our, our homes is where, we, um, is where we more easily form these relationships. And, and this has happened many times in my life at different places. Not, initi not initiated by me, but just I'm looking back and I'm saying, wow, that was God that did that. That wasn't, nobody decided to do that. Being where we can be ourselves, like the identity. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can say, Shh, and just, you know, kick my shoes off and just be myself rather than having to have formal airs and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yes, yes. 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 And, and that's a, we're, we're made for relationships, which, and that makes, you know, when I'm having a relationship with the Lord, it's like, wow. And I think I think of Enoch of old in the Bible, right? Uh, Three hundred years, you know, he walks with God. But he why is he doing that? Because he's saying this relationship I have with my son, Methuselah. Was it Methuselah? Was that his son? Do I have the right sequence? Yeah, yeah. This, is, this relationship I have with my son, man, this must be like. Yeah, this has got to be like what he has with me, and it just came alive. So he gives us. You know, right brain training into this is who he is. And, and like the pastor says, yes, spouse and sibling and parent-child. That's why he made us in his image. Just uh, perhaps answering the last question a little further. Uh, it's actually really simple, but I don't know why people don't believe me when I say that. Uh, to build community, you just need to start doing it. Visit somebody, yeah. go and do the first step, and gets contagious, like very quickly. You just need to be uh, willing to go and visit. Break the ice. Yes, that's. I, I like it's that. It's some, but I like that. It it is contagious. It is contagious. Why? Because our spirit beareth witness with. You know, the Bible says our spirit bears witness with his spirit, but our, bit, wi our spirit bears witness with each other. Yes, it's just, wow. Yeah. It's, he made us individuals, and, and how much variety is there? Oh, well, there's as much variety as there are people. Yes. <laughs> and so, and we all have different experiences, and we've got all the time in the world to share it. And it does feel good to try to understand someone and to feel that someone is trying to understand yes. you. It might be a challenge, but still, just the effort is still working. Yes. yes. And you know how to tell that it's working? Mm -hmm. Real simple. And that is that our right brain doesn't keep track of time. Mm -hmm. it, it knows nothing about time. Time stands still. But left brain. Left brain, left brain is this. So, <laughs> so <laughs> when, we're, when, we're, when we're in community, and, and it's contagious, right? And three hours went by. Right. What happened? You know? right. Or if I'm taking notes, you know, on a very complicated, it's like, man, when's this class going to be over? You know? And, and you know, uh, some of it's kind of cultural too. Was how you, you know, the environment you were raised in. Are True. More, some are, are more clock conscious than others. Yeah. True. Uh, absolutely. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's actually, there's, there's some uh, <laughs> like uh, we, cultural trappings that we are sometimes not very aware how they dominate on us. Like, I don't know if you ever, for example, somebody that's very different from Americans, right. Germans. Okay. Yes. Although on surface they, they look the same, right. but if you see two Germans talking, uh -huh. you think they're going to punch each other. <laughs> right. Because they have to go way up there, mm -hmm. then go down the hill to be able to understand. If they don't yeah, go really, there, they, yeah. they are not having a conversation. They don't, yes. they don't bond. Like, yeah. And for us, like, they, no, no, people, let's calm down. Like. <laughs> yeah, there's a professor and his wife that comes over to our home, right? Is he German? I think. Uh, um, Gus? Uh, no, he's Argentine. Argentine. Okay. And a lot of. 
Yes, a lot of Ar Argentines. Argentina, yes. yes, there's a lot of Germans in Argentina. Yes. And, uh, and his wife is uh, from Portugal. Anyway, Paraguay, sorry. Okay, all right. I'm going to get this straight. Pa Paraguay. Anyway, delightful people. And so he said to us, he said, um, he says, you know, he said, I, sometimes he says, I just want to go home. He says, being here in America, is, he said, I, is, I just can't understand the way you relate to each other. He said, it's so surface. <laughs> you know, he says, you're not, you know, I don't see connecting, you know, real connecting taking place. Wow. I, I said, yeah, you know, I said, I'm sorry, but, you know, so then, you know, he describes what it feels like. I said, yep, that's us. <laughs> no, I don't think of, uh, you know, we grew up in something. Right. We said, well, this seems normal. Right. No, not necessarily the best way to do it. Right. No. Yeah, let's talk about the fear of the rugged individualist kind of yeah. mentality. And that's, yeah. that's what we are, you know, as yeah. Americans. Like, well, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, true. Just, We're rugged individualists, yeah. Individualists. Yeah. yeah. And so, as a, as a denomination, we were called, what? To restore community. Yes. Uh, the, the culture, no matter what, where we are as Christians, the culture should be one of community. Yes. Yes. And that's attractive. That's contagious. And yeah, yeah. Stop by and visit each other. <laughs> it's really, yeah. It's, it's joy building. Okay, maybe we'll have prayer and, okay. and uh, <clears throat> we thank you for, again, for the earnest of community. Just being together today, enjoying one another, forgetting about the passage of time, knowing that you're among us, knowing that your spirit is working on our hearts, teaching us how to be vulnerable, teaching us how to form bonds, how to uh, convert the word into living relationships, and increasing our joy strength, and increasing our joy as, as we mature as well. And we thank you that uh, uh, your promises are sure, that uh, uh, you We've lived, and now we're getting older. We haven't seen the righteous baking bread, and that's just not physical bread, but that's spiritual bread. Amen. And that you're taking care of our, our, our needs, and you have, uh, uh, you have committed yourself to the battle. And teach us, Lord, how to keep looking at your face uh, so that it, it is so natural that even if we were isolated, at some point in a cell or anywhere else that we would still have community in our hearts, that we would still, we would see your face as the uh, patriarchs of old saw you as they went through their trials. So bless us as we separate. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.